go to Canberra now. Andrew McLeod is a visiting professor from London's King's College. He's an international e terrorism expert who, among other roles, used to negotiate with terrorists for the United Nations. He's also lived in Paris and is currently in Melbourne, I'm sorry, not in Canberra. In Melbourne, uh, Andrew McLeod, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, give us a sense of uh, where you're placing these attacks. Uh, it, we can say confidently it is a terrorist attack. Is it Islamist driven? Certainly everyone is saying there are terrorist attacks, but we need to make this point. Whatever cruel, mixed-up, horrible, evil ideology is behind these attacks, that ideology is not consistent with the God of Abraham, that is, the God common to Islam, Judaism and Christianity. So whatever these attackers might claim in the future, they are not representing that God of Abraham, as I said, the God consistent with Judaism, Christianity and Islam. How much do you think that would offer comfort for those who've been affected by these attacks overnight? Oh, none at all. I mean, people who have been affected by these attacks will be horribly affected for the rest of these lives, whether they are injured or have had loved ones die. I mean, there is no comfort in circumstances like this. And it doesn't matter whether you've been in the attack at Charlie Hebdo's or the current ones in Paris or you were caught up in the attacks in Sydney or indeed drone strikes. You know, when you, loved ones are killed, there is no way you can get comfort for that. What does the modus operandi of these attacks tell you about the attackers themselves? Well, there are two things which, which are really concerning about these attacks. The first one is the French have a very, very good counter-terrorism and a very good surveillance system. And this is a very well-planned attack with a number of people. And the planning took place completely under the radar. And this is the way you're now seeing what used to be called lone wolf, but now let's call them lone team attacks are taking place. Very smart to do it under the radar, not involving electronic communications, which means the threat for these sorts of attacks is growing. So in the immediate term, Western governments need to look at better ways to counter attacks like this. But then at the long term strategic level, Western governments need to start asking the question, who is the us and who is the them in the us versus them concentric circles in the culture war that is coming? Is it us Westerners against all Islam or do we want it to be us moderates against all radicals? And if we're wanting to unite with moderate Islam against radical Islam, we need to rethink our strategy. How do we do that, given, as you say, these uh, circumstances uh, would just make the idea of uh, a compassionate outlook for who's responsible and their modus operandi just so difficult to accept? Well, let's remember who is responsible. If it turns out to be a religious-based attack, the God of Abraham, the God consistent with Judaism, Christianity and Islam, there is no decent theology under the God of Abraham that supports these sorts of attacks. So they might claim religious connection, but they are not consistent with their religious beliefs. Now, if it turns out to be Islam, then we need to look at moderate Islam. Already on the Twitter sphere, you have people saying, when will moderate Islam join our war against radical Islam? And these, wars, these words are really important. Very many more moderate Muslims are dying from radical Muslims than Westerners have been dying. And if you look back to Charlie Hebdo, our response to a dozen journalists being killed was to have a lot of world leaders and hundreds of thousands of people marching in the street demanding the right for free expression to insult Islam. No one said those cartoons weren't insulting. So we were demanding the right to insult Islam. But at the same time, 141 children and six teachers were killed in the army school in Peshawar by, mod by radical Islam. So we were almost silent about that. So the signal we're sending to moderate Islam is we want to insult you, but we're going to be silent when your children die. And that's what I mean. We need to rethink this. If moderate Islam and moderate Westerners can come together to to tackle radical Islam, then maybe we will win. But if we continue to push moderate Islam into the hands of the radicals, we'll lose. Andrew McLeod, what is going to happen in the next few days? How do mm. moderate Muslims respond to the almost um, guaranteed wave of retaliation and ill will that will unfold from these attacks? Well, this is what I ask everyone to consider. Who do you want to be in the us versus them culture war that we are finding hard to avoid? Do we want it to be us, all moderates, against them, all radicals? Or do we want it to be us, Westerners, against them, all Muslims? I don't think the second is a good idea. If we want it to be the first, us, all moderates, against them, all radicals, then we need to find a way of reaching out to Islam, reaching out to moderates, and saying we recognise that moderate 
corporate Islam and us Westerners are all victims of this evil ideology, which is a distortion of the beliefs of the God of Abraham, the God consistent with Islam, Christianity and Judaism. So we need to reach out to moderate Islam and say, we see these people are attacking you just as much as they're attacking us. And we need to unite and combine against this evil scourge of radicalism. Uh, what do you say, though, to those Muslims who are openly fed up with having to justify their religion. I'd say, look, it's a natural response that people are going to attack the ideology that the attackers and the perpetrators of these evil events will claim. Now, the FBI released a study recently showing the number of attacks over the last terrorist attacks over the last 20 years in the United States. Roughly 6% of them were per perpetrated by Muslims, roughly 7% perpetrated by Jews, and the rest were perpetrated by neither Jews nor Muslims. So in fact, the perception of the number of attacks against West being in the hands of radical Islam and the reality are diverging. What we've got to do is really say to moderate Muslims, we know a lot of people are going to attack your religion. The evil people, the ones who have really undermined your religion, are these radicals. And we need to find the common language and the common cause to defeat radical Islam. And we can only do that hand in hand with moderate Islam. And for all those right now who are saying, when will moderate Islam speak up against radical Islam? I say to them, look around the internet. Look around at the number of moderate Muslims who are already speaking out against radical Islam. And we need to recognize that they are doing so and we need to find ways of working with them. Because if we continue to push the moderates into the hands of the radicals, we will lose. Uh, Professor Andrew, Andrew McLeod, um, in terms of France's domestic policies, mm -hmm. um, is there something, uh, why, why is it that twice in one year France has been subject to these attacks? What is it about mm -hmm. the French people, the French uh, outlook on the world, their culture that, that, that so seems to, so, to, to sort of attract these sorts of radicals? Now, I, I think there, there's a couple of areas in the premise of your question, if I may say it with due respect. I think one of the, the challenges has been the ongoing integration of different cultures into France from their, uh, their colonial days, and they've certainly got a number of issues that date back to French foreign policy in Algeria. What France hasn't done as well as Australia has done is integrate incoming migrants into our communities. And Paris, particularly the northern suburbs, tend to be a lot more ghettoised than suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne are, for example. Australia is rated by the United Nations as the second most multicultural country on earth and probably, together with Canada, the most successful multicultural country on earth. The integration that we have done in our communities with incoming migrants hasn't been reflected in countries like the United Kingdom or France to the same extent. Part of the reason for that is there's a much longer history of an inherent culture that migrants are coming into, whereas countries like Canada or Australia have been built on migration, so we've had a very fluid host culture already. But this is a challenge. As the world continues to multiculturalize, as you see more travel and more communication, it is a challenge for all planners to start to figure out how do we make Different cultures live together in the same geography, and we've not found the solution for that. All right, Professor Andrew McLeod, we'll leave it there for now, but we appreciate your insights. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.